uh, know the homesteads and you're here. Um, and um, we're so appreciative that you're here. I'm so appreciative of Janice and Bobby. You know, the homesteads uh, have gone through um, so much. And I've seen um, Janice and Bobby uh, through it all, continuing to depend on the rock. Solid foundation for their lives. And they built their lives and their family on the rock. And get ready for an awesome testimony. Um, get ready to be encouraged and see how it applies to your life. You know, um, I know Bobby. Um, I was a, a college student and um, just trying to figure out this whole Jesus thing. I'm not sure what's going on. And Bobby was a huge encourager. And Bobby, um, as a pastor, uh, loved and pastored me. Um, and Janice has just has been uh, such a huge influence and a blessing and a light here at Salt and Night as we're starting to um, helping and blessing the women's and the women's ministry and doing all that. And um, just their family. And they mean so much to so many of us. So, anyway, are you ready? Yeah. Are you ready? Let's get everything like uh, Janice all set up.
60, that's what he sees. He sees, he just shows me pictures. That's my language with God. And in 1 Corinthians 14, it talks about the gifts God gives us individually. That's my gift, so. Um, we were married in November of 2001, and by the summer of 2004, I was pregnant with a little boy. And so I was sitting on my bed, and the Lord showed me a picture of two kids, two little boys. And one little boy was so handsome, and he was so hoppa, wasn't smiling, he was very serious, just um, really good looking. And I thought he looked like about five years old, and he was sitting on the beach. And then the second little boy was super Asian, and my best guess was Korean. Um, I had lived in Hawaii since I was 19, and at that point I kind of figure out some Japanese, Korean, Chinese, Filipino, kind of. <laughs> Where's Kevin at? Kevin, you confused me. I <laughs> so um, this younger boy looked Korean, and he was sitting in the dirt with navy blue high water pants on, and a red shirt, and um, I thought he might be a little on the spectrum, like a little special, because in the picture he was like this. <laughs> and so I immediately knew that the Lord was showing me a picture of my kids, and I didn't know which one of those boys I was pregnant with, but I knew they were both my kids. And so I just tucked that picture away and didn't think about it until I was about six months old and I had a stroke. I was diagnosed with a blood disorder called thrombocytosis. I had to go on a very serious medication that would keep me from having stro strokes, but it would take away my chances of having more children. And it was so sad, and even though Bobby and I had planned to have lots of crazy little Olsies running around, there would only be one. It was a time of shock and grief and grieving my expectations of what I had wanted for my life. And it's not what I planned, and it's not what Bobby signed up for. So, um, we had, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the clicker, um, We had this beautiful little baby named Rocco, though. And we love him with every ounce of our being. And even though we yearn for a whole minivan full of little yummy Malasada, Malasada Rocco babies, um, it just wasn't gonna be that way. So, one night, I was looking through pics, from Costco that I had gotten back, because we used to need that back in the day. You used to develop your pictures from Costco. <laughs> and um, I looked at this picture of Rocco. He was six months old, and he was tan, and he was hot and he was beautiful. And I realized how Asian he didn't look. So I said, you know what? He's the older boy that God showed me. And so I immediately thought, I get one more. I know that I get one more. And I remember the picture that the Lord showed me in faith. I fully expected that if Rocco was the older boy in the picture, then one day, soon, I thought, I would adopt a younger boy. During that time, Bobby was the assistant pastor at Hope Chapel Boy Kai. And our lead pastor, Regan, announced he was leaving a plant to church and asked Bobby if he would take over. Um, here's another not so in the plans. Bobby had told me from the moment I married him, I would never want to be the head pastor of the church. <laughs> he preferred hiding behind the soundboard and not being seen. He's in the back row right now. Um, so, of course, I was confused about what we were supposed to do with the job offer because we would live in Hawaii Thai. We couldn't afford to. So, uh, I was praying about all this and trying to put the pieces together. You know, you do that, you're like, okay, you can kind of see half of this picture, not the whole thing. So I was just asking God, are we supposed to do this? Are we gonna live in Hawaii Kai? And first he showed me the numbers, 825, and they were wrapped in ivy. And then when I asked him, are you going to provide a house we can afford in our community? Is that house our house? Is that house our house? Um, he said, no, you're going to live at 1036. So of course, after I shared these things with Bobby, he said, do you know that Hawaii Kai zip code is 96825? So I said, take the job. God is going to get us a house in Hawaii Kai with the address 1036. So I looked everywhere for that number, and when I couldn't find it, I tried to match it to Bible verses, and people's birthdays, and the longitude and latitude of 1036, everything. So we all do this, right? We get little signs, and then we try to figure out, what does that mean? We try to interpret it. So I didn't find it, 
And after three years of pastoring at Toikai, we felt very strongly the Lord was calling us to the mainland where my family lived in Spokane, Washington. We didn't know why, but we followed his lead. So we bought a house whose address was not 1036, and we loved and lost a little boy from foster care named Noah. Uh, we found an amazing school for Rocco. We served at the church in our neighborhood. Um, and three years after we moved to the mainland, Bobby's mom here in Hawaii was diagnosed with cancer. And she was told that she had a short time to live. So my mother-in-law is Japanese from Japan, okay, old school. She's quite the woman, strong, opinionated, capable. <laughs> when they told her that she was dying, she quit the garden club. She stopped having coffee at McDonald's with her friends. She went home and she wanted to die. So she had missed my father-in-law so much since the day he had passed. And 18 years without him was enough for her. She was ready. However, she didn't die. She just became bored. <laughs> she called us a lot. And came on to tell us how bored she was. So we made many, many, many trips back to Hawaii to be with her at her appointments and help her. We had a trip planned in the summer of 2011 to come back and check on her. Rocco was seven, and he told us that he wanted to get baptized. And so um, mom had received Jesus 10 years beforehand and hadn't been baptized, so she said we should do it together. Mm -hmm. And so all of mom's Japanese friends from church, um, our friends from just life and Hope Chapel days, and some of my family who was in town, we gathered at Baby Queens and they were baptized. And I didn't know them very well at the time, but even the followers were there. And, uh, hold on, let me figure out. So I can't tell you guys at the moment how significant that day was, but in a minute you're going to trip out. So um, here's a picture of Amy Miley. Oh, yay. And I have a picture of Sky too. I'm sorry, Sky, that you didn't get your shout out. So here's your picture. You're there. Sky was there. Aww. She was just a sweet little baby. Anyways, um, so um, in the fall. 2011, Rocco's Auntie Tammy sent him this Shutterfly book, all the fun adventures she had taken, him on during that trip, including pictures of the baptism. And so, there you go. Um, when I saw the cover of the book, you could have knocked me over with a feather. The picture his Auntie Tammy took of him at seven years old was a picture God had shown me to a T, the non-smiling face, super handsome in the sand. Is that baby? Um, when I was pregnant with him, there was no way I could have known what Rocco was going to look like. At that age, he wasn't five, he was seven, but what actually worried me, though, was that we didn't have the other little boy that God had shown me. So I really thought I misunderstood what God said, and I missed our chance for the other little boy along the way. Um, Mom passed away in April of 2013, and we grieved her loss that year and processed in our hearts where we were at in our lives. And in my heart, I was trying to let go of the idea of adoption. I just kind of thought, like, family's getting older, we're moving on, we don't have the money for this. And then um, in early, 2014, Bobby just turned to me, we were riding in his work truck, he turned to me and he just said, how do you know that the second little boy was Korean? And I just told him, I know my Asians. <laughs> he looks Korean. And I know he's adopted because I will never give my kid a bowl haircut. So, Bobby told me in his work truck that day, driving past a beautiful park named Manito, Going down these tree-lined streets is all slow motion for me. These tree-lined streets on this road called Grand. He said, um, let's do it. You go figure out how to get us a Korean. <laughs> <laughs> Bull haircut, special little man. <laughs> so before I, he changed his mind, I levitated home and I jumped online. And in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip forward two years to the fall of 2015, because if you're paying attention, I just skipped over two years, and that's called the process of adoption. So, uh, Jesus gets us through the adoption process. 
In the fall of 2015, we got on an airplane to South Korea to meet our now four-year-old little boy. We were matched with since he was two. Oh, look at that full haircut. Um, <laughs> so we can only meet our son, Dylan G. Olmstead, on this trip because the process of waiting requires you on your first trip to South Korea to go in front of South Korean judge. The first trip to Korea was the happiest time of my life. Uh, Bobby and I are so fun to travel with. Uh, we are adventurous, we love good food, we walk 12,000 steps a day, seeing every inch of our son's homeland. We just took it all in. So, if anybody needs some travel buddies, uh, we basically rock Korea. <laughs> so, um, later I hope that I can share more about every tier and ear to ear grin we experienced meeting our son. It was all of our hopes fulfilled. But, um, since Korea is currently my favorite place on earth, I should probably get paid to promote it because um, I emphatically tell everyone I meet, you must go to Korea. Are you hungry? You should go to Korea. <laughs> Do you want to have the most vulnerable life? You should go to Korea. Um, when we met our son, Dylan, for the first time, we were blown away. We were in love. He's so funny, he's so loving, he's just so perfect, and <laughs> the bull here. <laughs> he looks like Kim Jong Un in that picture. <laughs> so, after we met him, we needed to wait an undetermined amount of time to be approved by the judge for our adoption. He sadly left Korea and hoped to return in about four weeks, which was usually the quickest amount of time that it took, but some families waited months, so we were hoping for four weeks. The wait at home was a lot of nesting and excitement. Couldn't stop looking at our pictures of Dylan, whose Korean name is Jinom, and it means great man, and eventually it's just gotten shortened to G. And um, if you call him Dylan, that's his American name, he knows that, and he can spell it for you. So, either or. So we did this funny thing while we were waiting. So excited to share this with you. Uh, we looked at pictures of what we were doing when G was born. Where were we? And, ta-da! We were in Hawaii, Fowler's, with Mom getting baptized. So, Mom and Rocco got baptized the same week that G was born, the same week that that picture that God showed me when I was pregnant with Rocco was taken. I was looking at this uh, picture of us together on the first trip to Korea, and um, it, it'll show up. I was looking at this picture um, on our first trip to Korea, and um, wait, sorry, I lost my place. G is wearing a red shirt, blue pants, big cheesy smile. The picture will show up later. So after about uh, two weeks, we got back home, uh, and then we were approved to go back to Korea in another two weeks. So we bought our tickets, and we tried not to look at the ticking clock. During that time, my right side was hurting me, and I told Bobby, I think I'm having appendicitis. And so on a Saturday, we rushed to the ER, and I excitedly told the doctors, make this thing out, because I have to be back on a plane to pick up our little boy in 12 days. So we showed all the doctors and nurses pictures of us with him on our first trip. We've never seen more eager group of people so happy to pull out an appendix. Um, everyone's just really excited. The head ER doctor had adopted a little boy from Korea in the 80s, so he was just all about it. And after my abdomen scan, um, he came back in the room and he shut the door behind him and he was kind of ashy and he was hanging his head. And he just very sadly said, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not her appendix. And um, it was totally over our head. We were just, we didn't get it. And I just remember him saying that my bones had changed. I really needed to go to an oncologist. There was marbling. I didn't even process any of it, nothing. So I'm a rule follower, and even though I had not crossed it, processed for one second what the ER doc said, I made an appointment to see the oncologist the week that we were leaving for 
Korea. So that weekend, leading up to the appointment, Rocco had a soccer game in Sandpoint, Idaho. And during the car ride, God showed me a picture of a volcano. And I knew it was super important. I just didn't know what it meant or who God was talking about. I thought about it all weekend, told Bobby about it. And I said, you know, all I can gather from that picture is that the volcano has the potential to wipe everything out and kill everyone. Um, but in this picture, no one's going to die because the volcano is dormant. So it's just big and scary maybe. And like I do with a lot of pictures that God gives me, I wrote it down and stored it away in the back of my mind. Monday morning, Bobby and I walk into the oncologist's office, November 9th, 2015. She was a young Chinese from China uh, doctor. She kind of had a bold haircut, true story. <laughs> but uh, she just started drawing on this piece of paper. She drew a bell curve. And she said, you have five years to live. You have myeloid fibrosis. Your bones are scarring over. You'll need to find a donor to give you a stem cell transplant. We don't do those transplants in Spokane, so you need to go to Seattle Cancer Care. And I was crying, but I didn't really get it. I was only 36. And so in the parking lot, I asked Bobby, did she say that I have cancer? And what the heck is myeloid fibrosis? And so, we had to Google it. We didn't understand any of the words that she used. And it falls into the same category as leukemia. So it was a Monday, and we were leaving Friday to pick up our son in Korea. I called my friends, called my brother and my sister. My sister left work right away and came over to sit with me. We were floored. And all the exponential joy that I had felt during the last few weeks after meeting Jane just and I was devastated and crushed for my family. Um, how would Bobby raise two boys on his own? He'd already been through so much devastation in his life and didn't deserve this grief. I thought about how close I was with Rocco and I wondered at this age, could he remember for the rest of his life how much I loved every fiber of his being? And when I wasn't there to laugh with him or answer his question, See his accomplishments, was he at least bold enough to know that I would never intentionally leave him? For G, with the short time that I had left to love him and adore him, destroy him when he had to say goodbye, or would he not sadly even remember this woman who had prayed and waited and hoped for him? And then, all moms know, like you do, you suck it up. So on Friday, we got on a plane and we had to pick up our boy. I don't know how I did it. I don't know how any of us did it, but maybe in my heart, a thousand times on the way to pick up G, I just said, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. I would never want to leave you to do this to you, and I'm so sorry. Days later, we woke up in Korea after taking custody of G, and found out that 75 mile an hour winds had slammed into our neighborhood and knocked down hundreds of 30 to 40 foot pine trees. Um, you can't even see our house. So uh, there was no electricity and our neighbors, 40 foot pine had fallen in front of our house and smashed Bobby's work truck. We came home with our little boy to freezing temperatures, no electricity and chainsaws running from 7.30 in the morning until nighttime. G was traumatized, so well, mommy and daddy. So, um, desperation to find a doctor and get a transplant pushed us forward. We ended up deciding on a doctor and treatment at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona. And um, over the years, Bobby and I had developed a motto for our family that we try to always live by. We go in together and we go out together. So, we all travel to Arizona. G had only been home about three months. Um, poor Bobby is very practical with money, but I demanded that we stay at a beautiful, expensive hotel because if this was all the time I had left with my kids, I wanted the pictures to be pretty. <laughs> They're very expensive pictures. So, I'm an aesthetic person. We stayed at a beautiful, expensive hotel. Look how pretty that picture is. <laughs> And um, while we were after the trip to Arizona, we decided to uh, 
that we were going to drive to Disneyland with the boys to make as many sweet memories as we could. So I think when we met with the doctor there in Arizona, we expected her to say, this isn't as bad as what your doctor told you, but uh, she confir confirmed I was very sick and I didn't have very much time left. And I was just sad, shell-shocked, sleep-deprived, because Gigi still woke up every single night, about four to six times a night, crying or screaming. And in a daze, I remember texting my girlfriend, Kristen Dore, and saying, it's bad, it's really bad. She said probably the hardest thing a friend has had to say to another friend in their most devastating moments, but I will always be eternally grateful that she spoke these words. So if you guys are in this situation, you can take cues from this. Um, she said, if this is all the time that you get, there's no time for crying. You put a smile on your face, and you need to be present with your family. There is no time right now to be sad. And so I talked to her about this the other night, and she said, well, when you tell me how that said that, it sounds very rude. <laughs> but I said, no. It was pure gold. So um, on the drive to Disneyland, I made a plan. I'm going to smile like it's going out of style. <laughs> and these are the pictures that Bobby will look at on our anniversaries without me. And these are the pictures my kids will show my grandkids that it's on. And we killed it at Disneyland. <laughs> I'm serious. We're super fun people to travel with. It's our strong suit. Um, Bobby got checked for bombs because he looks like a terrorist. And every single time we entered Disneyland, he was flipping around to the security team. I'm like, they will take you down. We stayed too long. It was a long trip. We should have gone to Disneyland that many days. They were on to him. Um, but anyways, we got back to Spokane. G still didn't speak any English. He was four years old. He went half days to preschool just to socialize them, and Rocco was in the fifth grade. I didn't have a donor match yet, but I didn't cry that whole spring, and I didn't cry that whole summer. And I shoved as much life and fun into those months as I could manage. As I could manage. But there was so much pressure, and I don't, I don't know how we didn't explode. Just the pressure of my illness and the sleepless nights, and we were just tired emotionally and physically. We were in pure survival mode. So, my little friend, Tammy Moniz, over here in the corner, got on a plane in May of 2016 and walked through our door on a mission to refresh. And I actually can't convey how timely her visit was because we were spent. She cooked for us, played with our kids, made us laugh, took us on adventures, let us sleep. Um, it was a blatant act of kindness. It was pure mercy. And I still didn't cry. So in September of 20, 2016, my babies, when Rocco went into the sixth grade and Jean went into kindergarten, I would come home every day after drop off, open my Bible, and I would sob. I would lay on the floor and sob my eyes out. Pick up for them was at 2.15, so I'd wash my face at 2. And I would go be a present mom with my kids. And for all the enormous grief that had engulfed me, I knew that I was going to be brand new in the arms of Jesus. So I wasn't sad for myself. I was just crushed for Bobby, and I was crushed for Rocco and Jean. And in the fall of that year, I was scheduled to go back to the Mayo Clinic to meet with my doctor. Bobby needed to work. It was easier to leave the boys in school. And so my friends from Bible study, two women named Kelly and Annie, who were in the later season of their lives than me, their kids were all out of the house and graduating from college. They jumped at the chance to come to Arizona with me. We went to the Mayo Clinic. Bobby FaceTimed in for the appointment. I was just in this deep fog. <coughs> During the appointment, my doctor moved the timeline for how rapidly my disease was progressing to just three years left. I needed to find a stem cell donor soon. Really couldn't process much, but the basic words, and even that didn't really sink in, and he had to drive the rental car the entire time we were in Arizona, because I was just somewhere else in my head. And I remember being on the freeway and going to someone's house in Arizona, and she was like, Janice, I told you about these friends of mine that moved here, and 
when she hears this, um, she's going to say, I don't talk like that. I'm going to say, yes, you. <laughs> but, um, she was just so excited and said, I, I told you, you have to meet them. She was so excited that maybe you can go to their church on Sunday and she could see their grown kids. And I was just in a car. I was just the one for the ride. So when these people named Lisa and Greg opened the door of their house, I kind of woke up for a minute. They hugged me, and I couldn't understand where I knew them from. So I asked them if they were from Hawaii. And they said, nope, but our pastors are from Maui. I was like, no, that's not it. I couldn't put my finger on it. So how the heck did I know these people? And I must have asked them a few more times if they were from Hawaii because their hospitality and their ease was just very familiar. Greg finally laughed and just said, Janice, we've never even visited Hawaii. <laughs> but I couldn't shake this weird feeling like something's going on. So, after dinner, outside by their pool, we're all talking a million miles a minute, three different conversations are going on, and I heard Annie at the end of the table ask her, what is the address of your church? He just shrugged, so she Googled it and showed him the phone saying, is this it? 1036 West 23rd. And I actually screamed, because I said, wait, what did you say? The address of the church is 1036? West 23rd, I told everybody uh, what I had heard from the Lord 10 years before, that I would live at 1036. That's where I would live. I instantly understood that God had always known about Arizona. He had always known about cancer. He had always known about adopting GD in the worst moment of my life. He had always known about a dormant volcano. I would eventually look Every day when I step outside my door and gaze up at Coco Head. So none of it was wrong and it was all covered and God confirmed for me in that moment that I would live. So that was just one of the most supernatural moments of my life. I told everyone, be quiet. And I called Bobby. Guess what the address of the church is that we're going to tomorrow? And he an answered without hesitation, it must be 1036 something. <laughs> and everybody at the little dining table was like, oh my gosh. So um, he was excited that finally after 10 years we could stop looking for that number on everything. <laughs> so I still needed a donor. My brother and sister were tested to see if they could be viable donors for me. And I found out the devastating news that Joe and Chris were not a match to donate their stem cells to me. It's weird though, because in that moment when I found out there were just these hot tears boiling down my face, I had a total faith that God had said I would live. So I thought, well, he must be choosing another way to save me. So the nurse who told me on the phone that my brother and sister were not a match said in the same breath, but we found a 10 out of 10 match for you. Hey, I've got to go. I'll call you back. <laughs> so, hot tears down my face because I only heard that I didn't have a match. Call Bobby and relay the conversation to him. I wasn't sure, but I think she said I have another 10 out of 10 match. What? So, Bobby looked at the time difference between Spokane and Arizona and was like, hurry up, call them back. They close in two minutes. So, I called back and a different nurse was like, let me check. Oh, yeah. See your brother and sister are not a match. Hot tears. But you have two 10 out of 10 matches and one 9 out of 10 match from the Universal Owner of Industry. Congratulations! And I'm like, that's so exciting. What does that mean? This is so exciting. What is, I don't even know what you're talking about. So there is a one in a million chance of getting a 10 out of 10 wow. donor. And I had two 10 out of 10s and I had one 9 out of 10 donor. So I had won the lottery. And when I got matched with the donor, he was a male from Switzerland who had the same amount of German, Irish, and Swiss in his DNA as me. So that's how we're 10 out of 10. We were a perfect match. And just for the sake of blowing your mind a little bit more, I'm going to share with you, my DNA is now male. Uh, I love hot sauce. I don't think I ever tried it before. I can dance now. I didn't have an ounce of rhythm before. Um, I'm always burning up hot, like I'm dying up here. Um, I used to wear a sweatshirt on the beach in 85 degree weather. My memory is horrible. I can't see without glasses. I've gained 40 pounds. 
I need a bigger podium. But anyways. Okay, so loud sounds scare me. I'm super jumpy now. Um, I was at the ABC store in Waikiki. Kristen knows this story. And uh, it was about a year after I had my transplant. And this lady and I were in that open cooler section, the ABC store. And she went to grab a drink and she dropped it. And this is me. <laughs> and then she jumped. So I scared her so bad. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I don't know why I did that. I'm so sorry. She's like, no, I'm so. It was horrible. And then another time, I ran into my friend Kareen at Target. And we're just talking, and a balloon pops. I freaked the freak out. I jumped in her arms. I started yelling, it's a shooting. <laughs> If you guys know Corrine, she's super mellow. She's like this. <laughs> and I'm like this. So, a little bit jumpy. I think it's like a little bit of PTSD. But anyways, um, I also haven't slept in three years. The radiation burned out my thyroid, which regulates my metabolism. So I'll be on meds the rest of my life. But I have a life. So, going back to finding out, I had a donor. We knew that that meant I needed to move to Arizona to do the transplant with my whole family. So I told Bobby that because we didn't know how the transplant was gonna turn out, what if my body rejects it, we should sell the house. Also, we had to pay for living in Arizona and him not working for six months to take care of me. And that way, they, I don't make it, they have cash, everything is packed, they can figure out what to do. I planned out everything that my family would need and have to do just in case um, I couldn't be there because I'm a mom. That's what moms do. They plan everything out. So uh, my friend Tammy said during this time, um, it was so sweet, she said, you know you matter too, right? And I said, no, I really don't. I said, if I don't make it, I will be in the arms of Jesus. And my husband will be alone. You're responsible for these little lives. It's heartbreaking in a million pieces. So I told her we need to make sure that he moved home if I didn't make it. Because she was about the only person who can boss him around and tell him, you're not okay, you need a break, I don't care if you're not hungry, you need to eat. I told him that I really wanted him to take the boys home to Hawaii, so he had a support system if I couldn't be his support system. So in January 2017, my nurse from Arizona called and said, you need to be here February. And I laughed at her. Like, that's crazy. We own a home. My husband has a job. My kids are in school, and I'm, oh, I'm dying. Okay. So I called her back and said, okay, we'll be there the third week of February. Because nothing else matters, and everything else just falls away. So Bobby had been getting all these messages and texts from old friends. What can I do? What can I do? I have to be able to do something for you. And he had been mentioning for a while that he wanted to set up a GoFundMe page so people could help. And I've never been shy a day of my life, but I wasn't the same person anymore. And all I cared about was, how can I make it through this for my husband and my kids? How can I set things up for them if I don't need it? So honestly, what I was like, I, I don't wanna do that. I don't want people feeling sorry for us. And honestly, who cares about money? Who cares? We're selling our house. Our friend Beth Ann from church had come to us at that time and told us that God had spoken to her and she was going to sell our house commission free. So for me, I was like, oh, we're good. But Bobby wanted to do it. And here's a takeaway, wives. Once in a while, even though you're 100% right, you should listen to your husbands. Once in a blue moon. Because three years ago today, we set up our GoFundMe page. And I spoke my truth and shared the harsh reality. And the most unforeseen thing I've ever experienced on social media happened. The page exploded. And I heard from friends from elementary school, uh, parents from the neighborhood that I grew up in. A Canadian I had never met but was praying for me sent $25. And for the first time in a solid hellish year, Bobby would race through the door and we would have huge smiles on our faces. And we would be so excited to tell each other which long-lost friend of ours had donated and left a sweet message. So it was the words and the love behind those words 
that I will never forget as long as I live. So much pure love and kindness shot through our computer, off of our phones, straight into our hearts, and the amount of people is that donated is very humbling. So, if somebody here donated, um, I just want to let you know that I stand here today with the strength in my heart for the love that you showed me, and I'm grateful. That was actually a side note because didn't even have time to pack. We had to leave. We had so many friends stay at our house and pack after it was listed and Beth Ann brought the cell. Our friends, the Gusties, helped remodel our upstairs bathroom for us with four kids in tow on school nights in the dead of a Northwest winter. And all I can say is Bobby and I have met the hands of Jesus and they are beautiful. Um, we got to Arizona. Tammy met us there. And a little fascinating fact from that time is that she gave Rocco his first ukulele at that time and taught him to play. And look where he is now. So uh, my new beautiful friend, my ride or die for life friend, Lisa Swinder was there waiting for us. And the church that resided at 1036 with the pastors from Maui, Dave and Kinder Promister, were waiting for us. They spoiled us. They played with my kids. They fed Bobby. They sat at the hospital with me. And I'd been in isolation for a month because my immune system was wiped out and getting any virus could kill me. And it's still a little too tender to totally share, but the year waiting for a transplant was brutal. Losing my hair, being in isolation, and radiation was barbaric. It was indescribably wearing on every ounce of my strength that I had mentally, physically, my heart and my soul, and that trauma has become a large piece of me. So, Bobby was mom, dad, hubby, he's super bugs, truly. His gifting in life is administrative duties, and even his gifting was tested. There was so much to do and going on, and he was just solid. And I think that a lot of times, the caretakers and just the enormous amount of give that they have to come up with is just not complimented enough and because people haven't walked in those shoes and they don't really know how much it means just to get a coffee or a hug or recognition that they matter to that they are seen and so um, i just want to tell my husband um you know, instead i wouldn't be here without you and the world is so much better because of you. i'm going to show a video of when I left the hospital and I surprised my kids. They didn't know I was coming home. I kept nagging the doctors over and over. I wanna go, I wanna go, I wanna go. I wanna leave, I wanna leave, I wanna leave. And then finally they were tired of hearing from me and this doctor, he said, okay, you can go. And I'm like, really? So it was very unplanned. I called Bobby, I'm like, hurry up, get the car before they change their mind. Get the pain meds, we're out of here. And so um, we got to surprise my kids. He had and then some. 
and I am alive because he sacrificed his sanity and got me back on my feet again. So because his job was to take care of me when we were required to have extra 24-hour care for the kids for the entire time, 12 families came during that time to stay with us for a week at a time after my transplant to help us. And so, I want to ask you guys, do you have 12 friends total? Like, people that you could live with for a whole week? Our family was cared for by the hands of God. We have so many funny stories from living with our best friends and caregivers. Auntie Cherie rode scooters with the boys at 10 o'clock at night. Auntie Charlene had a Nerf gun battle, and all the bullets were stuck in the chandelier in responses. <laughs> which the next one, Ma Fei, didn't like. When she came, she taught G to vacuum, so all the lines in the carpet looked like fresh cut grass. <laughs> Auntie Tammy got Rocco his first ripstick and said, if you fall off this and hurt yourself, I'm going to punch you in the throat. <laughs> Auntie Dixie made us take a major detour on the way to the airport to buy cupcakes from a vending machine. I didn't even know that existed. Rocco tortured our friends and family with endless hours of card games. And God helped me the amount of times G watch Moana should be illegal. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just the half I can remember because the radiation blitz my memory and I can't even remember my friends and I just being there. They were there for a whole week and I can't remember. So we decided towards the end of our time in Arizona that we just wanted to come back to Hawaii knew that it would be sort of like a subsistence kind of living because it's so much more expensive than the mainland, but home has so much more value than the stuff you can buy. So, I feel spoiled every day. Um, when I'm driving my boys to school and I pass the ocean. And it's hard to think of much else to ask for, but I hope that I always do appreciate that God assured me that I will have two boys. He told me that I'll live at 1036. He showed me the view that I would have to look forward to every day. And even though Jesus literally never promised we would get through this life tear free, he's promised to give us life, give it abundantly with real joy. So at the end of the day, when our breath is fading, when our time draws near, the real goodness of Jesus is realized. Because whatever ways that we sinned, and sin is just separation between us and God, whatever we did in this life, it's covered by the blood of Jesus. And we have the gift of eternity. So, there's no sickness there, there's no hurt, there's no worry, no broken bodies, broken hearts, just love. And Jesus, in very simple terms, is love. So, Tell you, whoever hears my word, oh, sorry, so in John 5, 24, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life, and they will not be judged. They have crossed over from death to life. So we want to take some time right now to pray for all the caretakers in here and the people that are fighting battles. Um, so we're going to do that, but if you want the love that I'm talking about. If you're curious about those gifts that God gives and you need that healing, um, I just want you to um, raise your hand and anyone around that person who is raising their hand can just jump up right now and pray for them and welcome them into the only thing that we can count on in this life and the next. So if there's anybody in here who wants that healing, wants that love, please raise your hand. If you could in this moment just if everybody could just close their eyes and I know as Janice shared there's one thing that 
spoke to your heart. In the Bible it says that the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It pierces the bone and marrow. Dividing soul and spirit. And I know that somewhere along this journey at Janice shared, you were touched. And that touch wasn't her words. It wasn't her story. It was his story. It was God's story played out in her life. So in this moment, I want you to think of what is that one thing that was spoken to you in your heart? Maybe you're going through a medical issue. Maybe you're going through a loved one that's going through a medical hardship. Maybe you're going through financial hardship. Maybe you're going through a marriage hardship. Whatever that may be. Maybe you're at a place where you're just so thankful, Lord, what, of what he's given you. Whatever it is, just acknowledge it. present a gift to somebody. I want you to hold your hand out in the front. And symbolically, whatever the Lord has spoken to you this morning, just put that in your hand. Say, Lord, here you are. Here you go. Take this. And maybe some of you are sitting here wondering what this journey with Jesus is about. And as Janice shared, really, he is the one that carried us through this whole journey and will continue to carry us. And if it's something that you desire, something that you want to say, Lord, I don't know this whole thing about a relationship with you. I want you to just express that to him and he sees and knows your heart. So Lord, you see people's hearts. May you bless them. I'm going to take another step here. If you're here this morning and you are, you know of someone that is dealing with a medical hardship, or you personally are going through a medical hardship, which We want to pray for you. If you would, um, just stand. I know it might be hard. It might be um, something that you don't want to express. But if, if that's you or you know somebody that you're burdened with and you want to pray, um, just stand.
Lord, you see all these people standing. You see all the people who are even seated and desire to cry out to you. I pray that right now they would feel your touch. I feel that, I pray that wherever they are, that you would meet them, that they would know your love, they would feel your love, but most of all, that they would get a healing touch. We pray for healing upon all areas that they're standing for, or maybe they're standing uh, on behalf of somebody. We pray for healing in the name of Jesus. Physical, emotional. That's why you came, Lord. You came to bring healing. You came to bring us life. So, Father, we speak life in the same way Genesis dry bones were brought to life. I pray that you would bring life into every dry bone, to every broken drink, to every broken heart, to every unfulfilled promise. God, we ask that you would simply be God. That you would rise up we don't want to know why, we don't want to know how, but we just want to be. We just want to be covered in your love and to be comforted. So Father, that's what I pray this morning, that you would bring comfort in the name of Jesus, that they would be comforted and to be able to see the light in the midst of darkness. Because that's where you shine the brightest in the darkest and most ugly moment in our lives. That's where you shine. So we put that trust in you, Father. In Jesus' name. The last thing we wanted to pray for was uh, Janice really felt that um, we want to pray for the caregivers. Um, I think for me, I, you don't realize the burden and the weight that it takes to be a caregiver. And maybe some of you are caring for your loved ones. Maybe some of you are caring for your parents. Maybe some of you are caring for your children who are in desperate need of help. And right now we just um, think we want to pray for the people who are providing direct care. Um, it's a huge need. It's a huge burden, and you can't you can't do it alone. You simply can't. when Janice was going through everything, you, like her, you just keep going, you just keep going, you just keep plugging along. But that is only going to last so much. And that's where we want to pray for you. And really, one of the questions that Janice and I get asked a lot is, how did you do this? How did you guys, how did you guys get through this? The question, the answer is, I don't know. Other than it was, by the strength and grace that God has given to us. So, um, if you're a caregiver, I uh, want to pray for you, want to bless you. And, uh, because God does, He cares. He cares for even you. You guys, if you guys want prayer, why don't we um, have you guys come forward and then um, we're just going to pray for you. Um, 
you know, um, I think it's only fitting uh, We have a pastor here, Max. He and his family um, are, are, are in a place where they're constantly caring for um, their dad. And it's a huge burden. Um, it's a huge uh, responsibility. And uh, like every, everything, everyone up here is, there is just a big, a weight that comes with caring for others. But really, isn't that's what life is about, right? It's about others. It's not about, it's never about us. It really isn't. Life is not about me. Life is about other people. And ultimately, it's realizing that God loves you. And the relationship of God is simply this, is the heart of the Father is the heart of the Father that is expressed through the Son in Jesus. And in the same way, the heart that is implanted in me from the Father, that's what's expressed. That's what the hands and the feet that Jesus is talking about. The hands and the feet is when we as people extend the love of God to others. And that's what you do when you care give for people. You're simply just expressing that love. So I'm gonna have Janice pray. It's gonna make her feel comfortable. She's gonna pray for everybody. Lord, I just acknowledge um, the hands that you use every day to take care of people who are in need and need assistance and maybe suffering and just um, the needs that they provide God, all the hats that they wear and the strength that they have to possess to get through the day and it's not what they had planned, it's not how they thought things would go but they do it and so I pray for supernatural strength for these people for their hands, God, for the love that they give. And I pray for rest for them. Pray for peace for them. Peace over mom and Jesus. And God, I just, um, I pray for goodness. I pray for joy during this time. It seems so um, opposite of what they're feeling and what they're carrying and who they have to be, God. But I just pray for a supernatural joy, God. And then would just be a week from you. They would just know that you see them and that they matter, God. So I just pray for strength for them and I thank you for each of their lives and I thank you for their hearts to take care of the people that they love. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you guys. Um, there's one thing to take away. It's simply that there's a loving father. That wants to, you to experience that love from wherever you're at. Hopefully that's the message that you receive that there is a God. There's a God that's not out there. He's right here. He's right here. And what you felt this morning is his presence. And for some of you, it's probably the first time you've ever felt something like this. It's not it's his love and his presence that is here that he wants to invite you into. So I encourage you, if that's something that you uh, want more of, in the same way that you would go out and seek after something, I would pray that you would begin to ask, God, what is that? I want more of that. Because I think this is what we all desire. And there is no place like being in the presence of the Father. So, bless you guys. Thank you for having us. I'm going to turn it back to Max. Thank you.
Thank you. Dennis, thank you, Bobby. The boldness and the courage and the love for being here. Why don't we all go ahead and rise? We're going to go ahead and close up. Sometimes it isn't easy to sing, and sometimes we don't have the strength to do it. Thank God He gives us the strength. He gives us the love. He gives us the courage. He gives us the boldness. So we want to be able to sing out in the good times and the bad. Let's go ahead and really let it out. Worship Him. Amen. Worship Him through the tears. Worship Him in the big smile. Let's get a worship.
this kind of just came up. Uh, we want everybody to know. So Janice's transplant was uh, this March will make three years. So it, I don't think we said this or she didn't say this, but she's completely healed. And uh, just so that you know, she's not like, uh, yeah, she's completely healed. Uh, we got a report even from her last visit to the Mayo Clinic in uh, September of 2019 that she doesn't even see an oncologist anymore. So really it's a uh, healing power of God. And, uh, so we wanted you to know that. So it's not like she's, you know, but thank, thank you. We praise the Lord for healing. So we want everybody to know that she's healed and the Lord has been good and faithful. So now you can actually just enjoy your lunch. 